Every expert in global public health told us that this idea was stupid and was never going to work. The technology wasn't going to work. Even if the technology worked, we would never get regulatory approval. Even if we could get regulatory approval, there was no chance that a country would actually pay us money to do this. If Zipline succeeds, then we will be able to move matter as quickly and efficiently as the internet moves information. Their biggest challenge will be scaling fast enough to meet the demand. Because I think if you can provide this teleportation service at an attractive price, demand will be almost infinite. I think that over the next 10 years, a new kind of global logistics network is going to be built. I think that company is likely to be bigger than UPS and FedEx combined. And I think it's likely that that company is going to have a tremendously important impact on humanity. Hello and welcome to Invest in Progress, a podcast brought to you by the Scottish Mortgage Team. I'm Claire Shaw, a Director and Investment Specialist. This podcast is designed to give you a behind the scenes look at the conversations that take place between our managers and the visionary founders, entrepreneurs, and business leaders of the world's most exceptional growth companies. As we are a UK investment trust, we can only market Scottish mortgage to certain audiences and in certain jurisdictions. Check out the podcast description to ensure this content is suitable for you. Also, please bear in mind that as with any investment, your capital is at risk. The first company we're going to talk about is Zipline, the focus of today's podcast. Now, most people think that new technology or advanced technology cannot start in Africa, but you couldn't be more wrong. Founded in 2014 and with Rwanda chosen as its first market, in its simplest form, Zipline is using drones to deliver blood and save lives. This is a company creating a completely novel way of operating a health service, particularly in low-income countries with poor infrastructure. So to discuss Zipline today, manager Tom Slater joins me. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. Tom, Zipline is one of those companies that I really think is going to capture people's imaginations. And I know you're recently back from visiting them in the US recently. So can you tell us a little bit about what is it they do and what is it that excites you about the company? Yep. So what they do is um, use autonomous uh, drone aircraft to build a modern, efficient logistics system, starting out in a healthcare setting and expanding into a broader market opportunity. Um, What really excites me about what they're doing is First of all, the huge impact that it, it can have because you know, if, if you can improve access to medical supplies, you can save lives, as simple as that. But also beyond that, providing access to economic opportunity for, for the billions of people who live out with a, a modern logistics service. And ultimately, um, their, their ability to impact the way we all live our lives and our, our access to, to goods and products. And in a moment, you're going to be speaking with Keller Renato, who is the founder and CEO of Zipline. So can you tell us a little bit about Keller? Keller is um, the founder of, of Zipline. He started the company back in, in 2013, 2014. He is, you, you, what we'll come across is huge enthusiasm for what he's doing, but also he combines that um, technical engineering understanding of what is a, a hugely complicated area with business acumen and a, and a vision of, of where he's going. Well, I know he's a fascinating individual, so very much looking forward to listening to your conversation. I was entertained to see you were wearing the um, Sun Valley coat because I just got made to take mine off. Yes. For having... <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It's a little sad. You would think that adults can clothe themselves, but apparently not these adults. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's embarrassing that uh, most of my wardrobe is provided by freebies. Yeah. Not even freebies, freebies yes. that I pay work for to make sure there's no compliance issue. But yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> Great to have you with us today. Could you start by describing Zipline and what the problem is that you're trying to solve? Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Zipline is an automated logistics company and the problem we're trying to solve is that logistics over the last 1,000 years in different forms has really never served all people equally. It does a good job of serving the billion people, the golden billion, uh, as they're sometimes known, so the richest people on earth. But 
the vast majority of people on earth don't have good access or any access to logistics. And as a result of that, five and a half million kids under the age of five lose their lives every year due to lack of access to basic medical products. So when we started building Zipline in 2013, our backgrounds were in robotics and software and automation. And it was just, it felt pretty obvious to us that there was going to be an opportunity to build the first automated logistics system and the first logistics system that would serve all people equally. We wanted to do so with technology that could be 10 times as fast, less expensive, zero emission, um, and far more accessible. We first met back in 2018, I think it was at a dinner in Arizona. We made our first investment for Scottish Mortgage shortly after. I I was struck then by this vision of national scale infrastructure, the ability to look beyond the the technical capabilities of drones, which is what the media seemed to, to be obsessed with at that point in time. But can you take us back to the founding of the company and the trip you took to Tanzania? Tell us about why that trip and the thesis that you had for improving on medical logistics was so defining. I think that we had a sense about how broken logistics uh, was and had a sense for what was possible. But, you know, every investor and particularly every expert in global public health told us that this idea was stupid and was never going to work. The technology wasn't going to work. Even if the technology worked, we would never get regulatory approval. Even if we could get regulatory approval, there was no chance that, you know, that uh, a country would actually pay us money to do this. And we had a sense that it was likely going to be smaller countries, more innovative countries. We were pretty focused in East Africa at the time, um, you know, spending time in Tanzania. I got to meet a researcher who had designed this system. It was an early warning text message based alert system where they could find out when any patient at any primary care facility was having an emergency. So like if that person was having postpartum hemorrhaging, um, you know, mom giving birth or bitten by a rabid dog or, you know, I mean, wide variety of medical emergencies. And he's, he showed me this database that he had all these text messages of all these emergencies, like, Hey, we need X, we need Y, we need Z. And I realized it's just a database of death because, you know, IT has advanced so quickly. We now have all of this knowledge about what's needed and exactly when it's needed, but there was no other half of the system. It was like, great. Thanks for letting us know, Yep. <laughs> you know, and good luck. And, and so to us, it was so clear that you just had to build the other half of the system. It was like, thanks for letting us know and help is on the way. When we saw that, we, we kind of felt like, you know what, we're going to ignore the experts. We think they don't really know what they're talking about. We're going to focus on working directly with governments that do deeply understand the problem. And that was kind of the path to launching with our first customer in Rwanda. I think you've described that as the perfect environment for Zipline, so challenging medical logistics environment but a government that was open to innovation. So how, how did that Rwanda opportunity come about? What were some of the challenges you encountered in those, those early months and years in the country? We had a sense that Rwanda, by virtue of being a small country, very technology forward, innovative, willing to try new things, uh, makes decisions quickly. You know, they kind of model themselves off of Singapore. It's a little bit like you know, a city-state in Africa. We had a sense that that would probably be a good place to spend some time. I remember meeting with the Minister of Health in Rwanda and saying, hey, you know, we were a team of 15 people at the time, 15 nerds, and saying, hey, we'll deliver all medical products to every primary care facility and hospital in the country. And I remember she looked at me like I was a total goofball and said, Keller, shut up, just do blood. Yep. It's a really important product for family health, but it's a total logistics nightmare. And so she basically said, look, here are 21 hospitals. Show that you can deliver blood to 21 hospitals. And uh, a few weeks later, Zipline signed our first contract with a customer ever, which was a $200,000 contract with the government to deliver to those 21 hospitals. And we were thrilled. We thought, you know, this is going to be great. We have it figured out. And then for the first nine months, Zipline only served one of those hospitals because we totally didn't have it figured out. Turns out operating a national, an automated you know, national logistics system is way harder than we were expecting. There were a huge number of problems in software and hardware and reliability that we had to solve in real time um, once we actually started integrating with a full national regulator, once we were integrating with the national healthcare system. Yeah, I, I really think, I mean, Rwanda was the perfect partner because they were both innovative but patient. They knew we were trying to do something for the first time in the world, and they were willing to give us sort of the time and space to like get it right for that one hospital before we expanded to 20 
Um, we then ended up expanding to 450 primary care facilities and hospitals across Rwanda. We expanded to all medical products a year later. So today we deliver the majority, you know, vast majority of blood in the country, I think 67% of the blood in the country. We deliver um, you know, millions of doses of COVID-19 vaccine, traditional vaccines, infusions, transfusions, cancer products, insulin, everything. Um, and then over the last couple of years, we expanded beyond R- Rwanda to seven more countries. Today, we serve 7,000 hospitals and health facilities, and it's become the largest commercial autonomous system on earth of any kind. Yeah, it's absolutely phenomenal, the growth of the system, and we should we'll definitely come on to that. But just sticking with those early days, could you, to, for listeners who who haven't seen a, a zipline drone, can you just talk about the the physical challenges you were trying to solve and what that first platform actually looked like? Yeah, I mean, the way Zipline works is pretty simple. You know, we our product vision is to approximate teleportation. And one important thing to point out, you know, none of our customers give a damn about drones. <laughs> like, they have no interest in drones. They don't care that the thing flies. They don't care about the technology behind it, the software, the control algorithms, the ground equipment, the regulatory approvals. They don't want to have anything to do with any of that. All they want is something that goes from point A to point B fast enough to save somebody's life. Uh, and so all of the things that Zipline is building in the background, I actually think one of the biggest you know, misconceptions is people look at it and it's like, oh, what a cool drone. And the reality is, you know, the aircraft is like 15% of the complexity of the system, you know, just as important as like customer ordering interfaces and regulatory software that we build so that uh, air traffic control can actually monitor the fleet you know, when it's flying at national scale data logging, computer vision-based pre-flight checks. These things are really boring and you don't know they're important until you actually start trying to operate at national scale and then have sort of a rude awakening and realize, wow, you know, you need you need the full system. But yeah, at the simplest level, the way the system works is that any uh, nurse or logistician or doctor at any primary care facility or hospital that we serve can basically press a button on a phone, order a product. As soon as we get that order, we take that product out of the small fulfillment warehouse that we run and operate. Um, We have it basically in a small electric aircraft. These aircraft weigh about 22 kilograms. They can fly 300 kilometers on a single battery charge. You can basically load it into that aircraft, launch it. Plane flies autonomously to the GPS coordinates of that facility. We deliver using a really simple paper parachute. So basically you can just consistently, gently place the thing in a mailbox. The mailbox is just two parking spaces, like a rectangle that's the size of about two parking spaces on the ground. And then the vehicle flies back. Once it flies back to the distribution center, we land, we can then put a new battery in that aircraft and have it launched you know, two minutes later, making another delivery. The overall system is meant to approximate teleportation and meant to just be fully automated logistics. It's logistics that works you know, in real time um, based on like the customer's schedule, not based on the logistics system schedule. Give us a sense of the impact that has had. You talked about the way that you've you've expanded from that initial hospital that you were serving to a broader range of hospitals, but what's the difference that it's made within the hospitals and, and the primary care facilities that you serve? Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing, you know, that impact question, this is something that I would emphasize again, almost every expert in global public health that we talked to told us this was a waste of time. It's not going to work. It's not, you know, this isn't even the problem. You know, logistics is actually good. I mean, every possible excuse you could hear. And it's only now, you know, four or five years later that we're actually starting to see full like academic studies of the impact of the system. So Rwanda actually just published a article in the Lancet Journal, a really prestigious medical journal, uh, showing that they've been able to reduce their national blood waste rate by 67% using Zipline, which is unheard of. It's absolutely astonishing. Yeah, pretty astonishing. And then just recently, um, just a few weeks ago, University of Pennsylvania published a study showing that at the hospitals that Zipline serves, maternal mortality has fallen by 88%, which is hundreds of lives of moms who are surviving and able to take care of their families. You know, it's actually hard to take those kinds of numbers and like really internalize them. But and yeah, that's why we do what we do. It's amazing to me that People have struggled with trying to get these, um, improve these outcomes, thrown enormous amounts of money at it. Billions of dollars. And yet with this one intervention, you've been able to have such a profound impact. There's such leverage into the system with with what you're doing. 
I think it's probably, you know, the advantage of taking a really orthogonal approach. You know, I mean, Zipline is obviously this just completely different idea. I think that global public health care is in the business of not taking risk and not losing money. You know, so much of the approach has been very incremental. It's been like, can we get a 1% improvement? Can we get a 2% improvement? And if you actually said, well, actually, forget the 1% improvement. What if we just wanted to fully solve the problem? What would be required? That kind of thinking requires risk. It requires transformational change. But it's actually the only way that we can actually solve these problems permanently. You've talked about Rwanda. You touched on Ghana. You've gone into Nigeria. You've expanded out of blood into, for example, COVID vaccines, gone into Japan, Ivory Coast, Kenya. Could you talk about what you think the impact that Zipline can have on healthcare inequality? Yeah, I mean, you know, one, a, a huge part of our mission is just that we think that everybody deserves universal access to healthcare. And I mean, one of the interesting things, you know, when the pandemic hit, we saw all of these traditional supply chains basically just stopped working because there were quarantines, people weren't allowed to leave their homes, you weren't allowed to be driving on the street. And so, for example, Zipline saw the number of, of vaccines that we were delivering in one week increase by 10x. So basically, like, all of the vaccine came to Zipline because Zipline was the only logistics system that continued to work, like, at scale through the pandemic because it's the advantage of having you know, an automated robotic system. We still have lots of humans, but working in different ways. And then interestingly, as the pandemic has subsided, that volume never left Zipline. It just stayed. It's as though you know, the medicine found a better way of going. And it's like, oh, well, why, why on earth would we go back to the old way of doing things? But that also challenged us to start solving new kinds of problems. I mean, we started delivering directly to people's homes during that time. There were hundreds of cancer patients who had been traveling to get their medication every month. And they weren't allowed to travel during quarantine. So the system that was doing that basically came to Zipline and said, can you just deliver this directly to the patients? And we said, yeah, of course, we'll try. And that's becoming a bigger and bigger part of our business. It's actually the main part of our business working with health systems in the U.S. You know, Zipline has signed up a number of different customers across the U.S., big health systems like Intermountain Healthcare, MultiCare in Seattle, uh, Navant Healthcare in North Carolina. All these hospital systems are actually now transitioning their logistics, their their home delivery to automated logistics via Zipline. Um, and so all of this together, like it's not just expanding into home delivery. It's also all these new use cases are coming out of the woodworks. I mean, Zipline last year started delivering animal healthcare products in a lot of the countries that we serve today. It's actually a pretty substantial percentage. I think it's like 20% of the overall deliveries we do are animal vaccines, animal healthcare products. The last thing I'll mention on the impact side is that and Zipline always hired in entirely local teams. I think this was also very controversial. A lot of our investors didn't really kind of understand this philosophy. I mean, I, I think you did to your credit, Tom. But um, you know, Zipline today is about half African, half American. We're a thousand people. All of our teams that run these distribution centers are like you know these amazing flight engineers and flight operators and fulfillment operators who are doing what some of the richest technology companies on earth have tried to do and failed. But like. Here, these teams have succeeded and built these you know, systems that are saving thousands of lives. And I think that this kind of infrastructure has become a pretty big point of national pride in a lot of the countries that we've launched it in. And I do think this assumption that like, oh, yeah, the U.S. will always lead the way in advanced technology and then you know, other countries will follow suit. I mean, that is not happening anymore. I think advanced technology is actually in many cases starting in smaller, more innovative countries that can move lightning fast. And then the U.S. is having to be a fast follower. Uh, that's what we've seen with Zipline. So sticking with this, moving from Africa into the U.S., maybe the listeners will sort of understand that there are big logistical challenges to solve in, in parts of Africa, but maybe a bit more surprised that actually you, you're now bringing this operational expertise into the U.S., you touched on this briefly earlier, but could you just talk about what, what it is you're doing for these big U.S. healthcare systems or planning to do? Yeah, we uh, this year, Zipline was awarded our Part 135. It's how the FAA certifies airlines in the U.S. There's no way Zipline would have been able to get that regulatory permission if we didn't have 35 million commercial autonomous miles under our belts. You know, we were able to provide this massive database of 
safe flight hours to the FAA to help them get comfortable with the technology, the scale, the safety mitigations, et cetera. Once we had regulatory permission to operate in the U.S., actually working with these health systems has been relatively straightforward. You know, all of them are coming out of COVID. They've seen telepresence explode in terms of, you know, the use cases and usage of telepresence has gone up 100x in the case of a lot of these health systems. And we really just talk about teleportation as being the other half of telepresence. If someone can now stay at home and hop on a Zoom call with a doctor and either get a diagnosis for themselves or get a diagnosis for their kid and the doctor can tell you, okay, I know what's going wrong. Here's your prescription. Now it's like, hey, stay at home. You know, We're going to have what you need delivered to your doorstep in five minutes. There's also this big trend happening in the US, which is like the consumerization of healthcare or the Amazonification of healthcare, I've heard it called. And the reality is people are starting to expect good service and convenient service and Healthcare has never been that, but there's a huge transformation happening in healthcare toward that. And I think back in 2020, you announced a contract with Walmart um, to provide on-demand deliveries of, of healthcare and medical products. And the launch of that initiative started last year, I think. So talk about how you're thinking about the evolution of the company beyond healthcare. Yeah, so Walmart is uh, one of our largest partners in the US. Uh, we started w- really with this vision around like, you know, prescriptions, health and wellness products, it was it quickly became clear that customers wanted everything. And so you know, we, we went from delivering a small number of SKUs to 3,000 SKUs to 12,000 SKUs. Now we deliver 27,000 SKUs of the 30,000 total SKUs in the store that we're attached to. The first distribution center we built is in uh, Arkansas. It's near Bentonville. And that distribution center basically enables teleportation of any essentially any product in that store to any home within 50 miles. And, you know, I I don't think I can share too much data quite yet, but suffice it to say, the data is really shocking and really exciting. I mean, I, uh, customers really, really, really love the service and they are using it way more than we expected, way more than people use most e-commerce services. So you, know, you can kind of imagine there, there are people who are literally ordering things on the system every single day. People are ordering like birthday cakes and rotisserie chickens and yeah, you can get anything. And um, turns out like, you know, if you make a service that's super convenient, like AKA teleportation, press a button on your phone and get it delivered to you 10 minutes later, people will use that service a lot. And has that led to you redefining your opportunity set, the addressable market, to now think about delivering much more broadly, competing with the likes of UPS or or Amazon or, or whoever that might be? I think that it's pretty natural. You know, I think it's smart. I mean, if you look at FedEx, you know, FedEx started delivering just like coast to coast document delivery overnight. That was like the thing that they did, and and they really nailed that. Obviously, over time, it's become this full global logistics network. I think that over the next 10 years, a new kind of global logistics network is going to be built. And that network is going to be automated. It's going to be zero emission. And it's going to be 10 times faster than any kind of delivery we've ever seen. And I don't think it's going to be the traditional logistics companies that build that. But I do think whoever successfully builds that kind of a company, I think that company is likely to be bigger than UPS and FedEx combined. And I think it's likely that that company is going to have a tremendously important impact on humanity, both in terms of issuing universal access to healthcare products, but also universal access to everything else. Could you talk about what the remaining challenges are to getting to the point where we're seeing your aircraft in in the skies in developed markets? Well, it's funny. I was actually just talking to a really good friend who lives in Bentonville, and he was he's a big mountain bike enthusiast. And he was like leading a group of 50 people on this bike ride. And so they headed out of Bentonville. And as they were coming back at 6 p.m., they came past the distribution center. And he said, he like stopped and looked up. And he was like, there were aircraft delivering. He could see aircraft over a couple of miles because at night we have running lights. So we're easier to see. It kind of looks a little bit like UFOs. And he said, holy crap, that was my zipline aha moment. So the reality is, um, depending on where you live, <laughs> we're basically already it's there. It's happening already. Yep. Yeah, it's happening already. And the funny thing is, whenever we get started, people are always, the idea of having an autonomous aircraft deliver something to you in five or 10 minutes sounds so bonkers. People don't really believe that it's possible. Also, everybody's like, well, Amazon said they were going to do this you know, 10 years ago and then didn't. So it must be vaporware. And so there's like seven days of you know sci-fi magic of people being like, <laughs> wow, I cannot believe that I'm having things delivered this way. And then on day eight, 
people totally don't care. They find it completely boring, but they're also completely entitled. Yeah. <laughs> like I've had doctors look at their watch and then look at me and say, it's 30 seconds late. <laughs> you know, it's like, wow. Like we went from science fiction to entitlement in about seven days. And that is, I think, one of the magical things about building new kinds of technology. It's like humans are very good at adapting. And once you realize you can like, you know, press a button on your phone and have something delivered to you 10 minutes later, um, people are not going to go back to the old way of doing things. Like this is a, it becomes boring. It fades into the background. It's just infrastructure. Like people don't care. The vehicles are silent. They're totally, you know, unobtrusive, way less obtrusive than trying to make deliveries on like sidewalks or roads. You can't really tell the difference between these aircraft and birds. So generally, like the neighborhoods that we serve love the service. It, it, it's pretty cool to see the way that like the technology, again, goes from sci-fi to just like totally boring. And boring is where we want to be. You know, boring is like, it's just normal infrastructure that you use day in and day out and you never even have to think twice about. And you, you touched on it there, but there have been several high profile attempts to launch a service like the one you're talking about. So why can a startup like Zipline succeed um, when others have failed at, at this so far? It's a little bit of a tricky question for me to answer because I only know what we do. I can't really speak to you know why tens of billions of dollars that have been spent in this space like haven't been able to really produce results. Um, but I think that when we were starting Zipline in 2013, we were not the biggest team. We were definitely not the best funded team. And we never even thought of ourselves as being the smartest team. But I do think that we were by far the most practical. Um, and that is really what is in Zipline's DNA. Like we are very scrappy, frugal problem solvers. I mean, you've been to our office, Tom. You, you, you looked around like it's not, I've launched a not a fancy. <laughs> yeah, you've launched aircraft yourself. You've been to our distribution centers. Like, you know, the reality is we kind of assumed that we were dumb. And in fact, that assumption was correct. We had a lot of the original design assumptions wrong and the original product didn't work as well as we thought it was going to. But I think that we were really good at moving fast and getting something into the real world and then learning by doing. And learning by doing, although it sounds extremely unfancy and obvious, the vast majority of companies, in at least in our industry, have not done a good job of that over the last decade. I think there, you know, there's been huge amounts of money raised and a lot of people sitting in kind of like R&D labs building cool technology, but not a lot of people rolling around in the dirt trying to make stuff work in the real world in unfancy places. I think the recent announcement by Zipline that you've managed to hire Deepak Ahuja, who previously served as the CFO at Tesla, is a, a huge endorsement for the company. How does attracting leaders of that caliber help Zipline? Well, I think that's a pretty easy question to answer. You know, there, there's definitely a point now where we are realizing the scope of the opportunity ahead of us is far larger than we first appreciated. And the only way that we're going to be able to really scale into that opportunity is to have a combination of younger, ambitious, but also stupid <laughs> leaders like me uh, with like people who have at least seen it, you know, once or twice. And, and we try to like balance, you know, we need people who like, we don't want to have to reinvent every wheel. <laughs> it's kind of how we talk about it. Like we do a lot of innovating and a lot of solving problems from scratch at Zipline, but if we don't have to solve a problem from scratch, like let's not, so we can focus our effort on just the problems we actually have to solve. And so, you know, having folks I mean, Zipline has learned a lot from Tesla, you know, specifically a substantial portion of the engineering team comes from Tesla, a substantial portion of the leadership team comes from Tesla. But I think like the way that we have been able to attract people who, you know, have already done extraordinary things in their career is that Zipline's mission is kind of our secret weapon. I think there are a lot of people who are sort of sick of this paradigm of like technology companies being evil and like destroying democracy or you know, whatever it is. And I think Zipline has been really focused on trying to show that, hey, like there are humanity level problems that are not going to be solved, but for new technology and entrepreneurship and innovation. And we should be getting the smartest engineers graduating from the best you know, universities in the world, focused on those kinds of humanity level problems that would make the world a more equal or better place. And it's a good business model to do so. You can make money, it can be profitable serving you know, these these kinds of markets. I think like if we can prove that, 
it will have a massive impact on the $4 trillion of foreign direct investment that happens every year, almost none of which goes into solving the kinds of problems I'm talking about. A lot of people want to work on those kinds of problems. And I think a lot of people want to be part of something that they can tell their grandkids, like that they created from scratch. And, uh, and so I think our mission has kind of been our secret weapon in terms of competing against much bigger companies that can offer like MBA level salaries, but like no, no, no normal startup can compete with like Facebook or Google on salary, but you can compete on mission. And I think that's been Zipline's competitive advantage. You recently became a father. Your wife's obviously very um, successful in her own right as well. So how do the challenges of dealing with sleepless nights and, and newborn babies compare to the sleepless nights you've had dealing with the challenges at Zipline? I mean, I think we're pretty darn lucky. Our daughter is, um, I think, as chill as babies come. So I think we got really lucky on that one. I do think it makes me think a little differently about how I spend my time. Our, our daughter Zoe is all, already um, over one year old. And wow, that went by like that. You know, she's about to be walking and talking. And it's like, we hardly even got to enjoy her as a baby. And whereas before, if I was on work travel, you know, maybe I'd like spend the weekend there. I'm like trying to be home every night. It's just constantly kind of remind myself, like, what would I give when I'm 80 years old for one more day with Zoe at this age? Yeah. You know, and I think for the answer is probably just about anything. I guess the last thought is, it definitely makes me more determined to hand her a world that we're super proud of. And a world that's like better and more equal than the one that we were given. I feel like we've, we've done an amazing job over the last 20 years of innovating in digital things that are bites but we've done very little when it comes to bits. You know, like our grandparents landed on the moon. We don't have that capability. Our grandparents could fly in supersonic aircraft. We can't do that. You know, our grandparents built the infrastructure for us that's now crumbling around us. Like um, one of my big hopes is that we can get back to like a really optimistic vision for the future that is actually based on us making the world better around us, like building more infrastructure, not less, and building it faster, not slower and building it so that it's available to all humans equally. Like that's the world that I am super excited to hand to Zoe. And so maybe just to push you on that a little bit further as a last question, what does the world look like if Zipline succeeds in its mission? If Zipline succeeds, then we will be able to move matter as quickly and efficiently as the internet moves information. That's a profound idea. I mean, not only will that save millions and millions of lives every year, but that will also enable a transition for instant kind of like last mile delivery to fully zero emission, which is a super important thing. And it will mean that all humans have equal access to, or, you know, at least far more equal access to like economic opportunity. And if we can create a world where logistics serves all people equally, I mean, logistics is, it's kind of like running water. You don't think that much about how cool running water is, but you would really notice it if you didn't have it. And it's a pretty big part of our quality of lives that we sort of take for granted. And I think that if we have an opportunity to transform logistics to make it 10 times faster, zero emission, less expensive, and universally available to every human on Earth, that's going to be an incredibly important change that's going to happen over the next 10 years. It will make the world look different. The world may look different from space. You know, this widest transition that's going to happen over the next 10 years is pretty darn exciting. I think that's a great note to end on. So thank you very much, Kala, for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's hard not to be impressed and, and humbled, I think, in, in equal measure in, in terms of what they have achieved. And I think maybe just starting um, with one of the comments that Keller mentioned about um Every expert, I think, in public health told them they were stupid and, and it wasn't going to work. But Tom, you first met him, you said, at this dinner in 2018. So what was it that he said that you didn't think it was stupid? Well, I think that the first thing that captured my attention was the vision of where this was going. This wasn't an ambition to create a device. It was to create a system, a nationwide system at that, for instant logistics. Second, they'd solved a lot of the really difficult technical challenges of, of doing this. And there are many. So in my view, the initial technological risk had largely been worked through. 
And then you're on this trajectory of continuous improvement. You know, a significant part of these systems is software, and we, we know how software systems can improve dramatically over time. And then there, there was Keller himself and, and just that X factor, that entrepreneurial drive and ability to get things done and really understand where you're going. And I think it was a combination of all of those factors. It's interesting you mentioned his X factor because I, I loved his comment about Zipline's mission is their secret weapon. And it's interesting, you know, we talk a lot about competitive advantage, but we often don't hear someone talking about their mission being their competitive advantage, do we? Well, I think that a significant part of that is competition for talent is intense. You need advanced software engineers. They also need people with aerospace expertise, hardware designers. And when you have these large online network platforms competing with you for talent, that's a really difficult environment to be in. But actually what you can compete on is doing something that people want to be a part of, that people really think they can have an impact at Zipline. And it, it makes it possible to recruit individuals that you couldn't compete for on, on money alone as a startup business. Yeah, and I think that it's clear that the culture that he's fostered within the organization, you can see there's a real sense of, of purpose. I'm kind of intrigued just from your perspective, you know, you meet so many of these phenomenal visionary founders and entrepreneurs, you know, what lessons or, or takeaways have you learned from Keller over the years? I think that one of the reasons he has succeeded where others have fallen down is not allowing access to capital to go to his head. You know, they've only invested in what they've needed to invest in. There's an Avanti projects, that, you know, they when I was out seeing them in, in 2019, they, they were running the business from shipping containers. It's this mentality that the vision comes first. It's not about making money, you know, in the short run. You know, that's that's an outcome of achieving the mission. And I, I think it's that mentality which has really been impressive at, at Zipline. And I think, you know, what you often talk about is we need to see ourselves as being partners to our, our companies, as opposed to just, you know, be seen to be kind of renting shares, if you like, in, in, in inverted commas. And I think, you know, when you're listening to Keller talking about some of the challenges, you know, that they've gone through, um, particularly in those er early days, what kind of support have, have you given Keller during some of the more challenging periods? I think what we can offer is a patient long-term approach. Now, if, if you are a business that's dealing with simultaneously with really difficult technological challenges, but also an evolving sort of business environment, negotiating contracts, that is not going to all go smoothly. You know, there are going to be setbacks. And what you don't need to be worrying about in that environment is, have I got shareholders breathing down my neck, demanding why I didn't meet the last quarter's numbers? You don't want to be worrying about fundraising and where I'm going to get the next check from. And so we make no claim to having any useful operational input. But I, I think a shared vision and trying to engage and do our part in helping that become a reality is is the crucial point. Yeah. And, you know, looking back, you know, we initially invested early 2018 and we've made follow on investments, um, you know, 2019, 2021. Do you think Zipline's a good example of Scottish mortgages approach? We scale up our investments as we build more conviction in the business model. Is that what's happened with Zipline? I think it's tied to the way we invest for Scottish mortgage generally, which is you cast the net widely looking for great growth opportunities. You accept that you won't be right about all of them. And in the ones that are able to deliver, being there and continuing to support them and building the position and building conviction. And that's why we have such a high degree of stock ranking in the portfolio at the end of that process. What do you think the biggest challenge is then to the company achieving the potential, you know, that Keller talked about? Well, I think the first part is um, the bureaucracy. And you know, you've seen very differing paces of acceptance and adoption from different countries. And so whilst the company can move very fast, they are held back by the environment in which they're operating in. And then I, I actually think if they're in the air and they can get pricing to an attractive standpoint, 
actually their biggest challenge will be scaling fast enough to meet the demand. Mm. Because I think if you can provide this teleportation service with very accurate timings at an attractive price, demand will be almost infinite. Yeah, I think the the scale of the opportunity is just immense from here. And maybe just one last question from me, Tom. I, I have to ask, what was it like to launch a drone? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's I think what underlies that question is this point that Keller made about the drones being 15% of, yeah. of the process. Actually, it's getting the workflows around it, making the operations efficient. And if you're actually going to build scale, that's what you need. So actually launching one of these things is dead simple. You know, push the button. But that applies about how complicated it is to have this 20 kilo object accelerate from naught to 100 miles an hour over the space of two meters to become airborne. So it's a really impressive thing to see, but I'm not sure my input was of any particular note. Maybe a better question for next time is, uh, what's the strangest thing that will be transported in a zipline drone, given uh, the things he seems to be mentioning that yes. they're <laughs> delivery, <laughs> which was news to me, I, I thought, think. I thought the rotisserie chicken was a, was, <laughs> was a rather noteworthy myself. A big thanks to our guest today, Keller Renato of Zipline, and to our investment manager, Tom Slater. Next time, we're exploring the commercial future of a completely different continent by speaking to the chief financial officer of Mercado Libra, a company often called the Amazon of Latin America. You can subscribe to our podcast to be kept informed of what is coming up and you can learn more about Scottish Mortgage by visiting our website, scottishmortgage.com. You've been listening to Invest in Progress. Thank you for joining us.